Hello, my name is Sue Becker, and I'm an owner and founder of the Bread Beckers in Woodstock, Georgia. And we just want to welcome you today to our um, teaching on the basic ingredients that you will need to begin your journey of milling your own grain to make your own bread. So we, I just think it's always important to know the basic ingredients that you will need uh, to make all of your own bread, cakes, cookies, muffins, pancakes, whatever you want to make from freshly milled flour. So we're gonna go over the basic list of getting started items, which is gone over in great detail in our little recipe collection that I put together many, many years ago when I first started on this journey. So you can find the basic list of um, these ingredients and an explanation what they do, what type of wheat to use for what type of recipe. But we just thought it's always helpful to go over that very first thing in our classes on getting started in milling and making your own bread. So first of all, in bread baking, particularly, wheat is the king of grains. And there's basically two types of wheat. There is hard wheat and there's soft wheat. Hard wheat is a high protein, low moisture wheat that is necessary when making yeasted breads. You must have that protein content to form the stretchy substance called gluten that is very unique to the wheat family. It's important that you have this higher protein wheat that hard wheat gives you um, so that this, as this gluten develops and the yeast feeds on the wheat, it produces carbon dioxide gas and this, this stretchy strands of protein capture this gas and allows the bread to rise. And I just wanna take a moment here to explain exactly what gluten is. There's so much misinformation out there, but wheat is very unique in the type of proteins that it contains. And it's really the only grain that the wheat family that contains these specific proteins. And when you mill wheat into flour, and you hydrate this flour with water, this stretchy substance called, called gluten forms. And it's, like I mentioned earlier, it's very critical when making yeasted breads. You need this stretchy substance called gluten to trap that gas and enable the bread to rise. And that's all it is. It's not something evil that's been put in wheat. It's the naturally occurring genetic sequence of proteins that is found in wheat. So hard wheat, again, is this high protein, low moisture type of wheat that is necessary when making yeasted breads. Soft wheat, on the other hand, is a high moisture, low protein type of wheat that is excellent when making cakes, cookies, muffins, anything that doesn't use yeast. And we'll talk more about soft wheat later and how to incorporate it and substitute it in, into any cake, cookie, muffin recipe um, that you may be wanting to change from white flour to freshly milled flour. But hard wheat is your choice for yeast breads. Now, in the hard wheat type, there are two varieties, two basic varieties. There's hard red and there's hard white. Hard red is gonna be a little more fibrous. It's an older, older variety of wheat, a little more fibrous, a little more flavor. Um, I love the flavor of hard red wheat for most of my baking, but then hard white is a much milder flavor wheat. Um, just a little, little bland for some, in my opinion, but, uh, but there's places where I want bland. There's places where I don't want the flavor of the bread to dominate. Where is that? Pizza dough. I want to taste the toppings on the pizza, not necessarily the bread. Garlic rolls, uh, breads that I might fill with, uh, we make a Reuben bread and a sausage bread all in our recipe collection. Those types of breads, I want the, the filling and the topping to be the dominant flavor. So that's where I might use hard white. For my day in and day out bread, my preference is to use two parts red wheat, one part white wheat, or half and half. The white wheat does tend to give a little more um, softness 
to the bread because it's a little less fibrous, but the red wheat gives you that great, great flavor. Don't be afraid of the flavor of red wheat. A lot of people think, oh, my family's used to white bread, so maybe I better go with the white wheat. But a lot of families find they love the flavor of the red wheat. And like I said, it is a little more fibrous, so a little more cleansing to the system. But either one or some of both makes a great option for getting started. I usually recommend to people, if you can afford to get both, I would always buy some uh, container of red wheat and a container of white wheat to get started. Because then you can make anything you want the flavor that you want it. So that's our wheat, hard wheat, soft wheat, soft wheat for pastries, hard wheat for your yeasted breads, red wheat, white wheat. Now here at Bread Beckers, we sell our grains in um, three different type of packaging. For those of you that are uh, going to make this your lifestyle, which we hope you will, we sell all of our um, grain packaged in six gallon food grade buckets. We package the grain with carbon dioxide, put a lid on it, and that way it is completely guaranteed to be bug free. The buckets keep out any pests that are the enemies of grain, which the three enemies are uh, rodents or things that eat grain, moisture, very prevalent here in the southeastern United States. You may be in a drier climate, but nonetheless, you don't want moisture getting to your grain. And then bugs, the little uh, grain moths and some of those other pests that really love grain that can be attracted to grain. So that's why we package it in these buckets so that it is moisture proof. A rodent could chew through this, but they don't know what's in there. They don't know what they're missing. And then bugs, as long as you keep a, a good lid on your grain, then it is protected. Now we package our grain in these buckets. We put carbon dioxide gas in there, which leaves no residue, but that's how we can guarantee that it is bug free and you won't get bugs in there if you keep the lid on. Now the lid that is packaged on this bucket is a pry, we pound it on and you have to pry it off and it's pretty difficult to get on and off. So early on, years ago when I first started, we discovered gamma lids. And what we do is we'll take the lid that's packaged with the bucket because it's cheaper that way and we replace it with this gamma lid. It's a two part system. So you just take the lid off Press the rim onto the bucket, press it down, and then now you have a lid with threads that can easily screw on and off. You can get in and out of this bucket and keep it closed nicely down. Kids can go in and out and close that lid tightly down. Once you put the gamma lid on the bucket, it's pretty much there to stay but you don't have to keep buying gamma lids every time you buy a bucket. Just when you buy a new package of grain, just pour it in your bucket that has the lid on it. So for my use and just to help things, especially with children that may be getting your grain or even just so I can just look at the lid, I have a bucket of red wheat and a bucket of white wheat. So I have a red lid on my red wheat and a white lid on my white wheat. And uh, so that makes, makes it easy. And we have other colors of gamma lids here too. But this just makes it very, very easy for getting in and out of that bucket, but then ensuring that this lid can be tightly closed so no moisture bugs or rodents get in there. So that's our six gallon buckets. For those of you that may be a little overwhelmed, and this six gallon bucket does hold 42 pounds of grain in uh, wheat. And uh, that will make about 60 loaves of bread. So you've got a, a, a lot of bread making here, but it stores forever. Remember that. Wheat, as long as it's kept dry and bug proof, rodent proof, this grain is just as nutritious today as it will be next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now, 3,000 years from now. Until you mill this grain into flour, it is storable. So that is the wonderful thing about grains. It is the perfect storable food. And grains and beans, seeds, are the new, most nutrient dense food that God has given us. So again, makes a perfect storable food. Won't lose its nutritional value till you mill it into flour. And then those nutrients begin to oxidize. Once the bread is baked, nutritional loss is minimal. 
So keep your grain whole and intact until you're ready to use it. That's what we're all about here at Bread Beckers. And that's kind of the whole premise of milling your own flour when you're ready to use it. Yes, it tastes great. Yes, you won't lose, uh, no, you won't lose the fiber and some nutrients, but it is completely storable, left whole and intact. Now also, we package grain down in two pound bags. If you want just a small amount of a grain to try, or if you just don't have a large family like I do, um, then this may be the perfect size for you. Or we do have these wonderful one gallon pails. And these hold about seven pounds of most of our grains and beans. There's a few things like rolled oats that only can fit four pounds in here, but it's about seven pounds of grain, particularly wheat. So this may be a great option for you. These lids don't need any, any extra uh, other lid. These come right on and off and they have a nice indention here. So several pails can stack up nicely in the pail. So six gallon bucket, one gallon pail, or a two pound bag. Just remember, you do not want to put your two pound bag just in your pantry like this on your shelf. It will attract um, pests and bugs and things that can get in there and uh, just kind of ruin your grain. So if you're going to buy the two pound bags, maybe get a pail. This will hold three of these two pound bags. Get a pail or some type of container to put it in or keep it in your refrigerator or freezer. Um, also, since I mentioned that, there's a lot out there. People say, oh, you have to put your grain in the freezer or something to kill those bugs. Um, you don't from bread beckers. It's already been done. That's what the carbon dioxide gas does for your grain. So you don't need to put this grain in the freezer or anything like that or any, whether you buy it in the pail or the two pound bag. Um, the only reason you would want to put this in the freezer is just don't put this baggie on your pantry unprotected. So anyway, that's why we recommend pails or buckets mostly. And uh, if you are going to buy a baggie, then just put it in some type of container to protect it. So that's our grain. Hard wheat for yeasted breads. Hard red is a little more flavorful. Hard white is a little more mild in flavor. But both make great yeasted breads. And hard wheat is what you need to make breads leavened with yeast. Speaking of yeast, we sell a Firmapan instant yeast in, or InstaFirm instant yeast. And uh, this is good for any type of yeasted bread baking, whether you're in a bread machine or a mixer or by hand, your instant yeast is just so, so easy to use. This ye any instant yeast does not have to be soaked in water and softened prior to use. It can actually just go in your dough with your flour. I usually put about half of my, all my wet ingredients, half my flour, then sprinkle in my yeast. Remember, yeast likes warm and moist to grow. So the warmer the climate, the, the warmer the temperature in your home, the faster the bread is going to rise. The colder the climate, the slower the bread's going to rise. So those are things that you need to remember when making yeasted bread. Now, our yeast is in a one-pound package. It is so reasonably priced. And, um, but once you uh, unopened, this is storable for about two years. That's about the code date on here, two years from packaging. And, uh, but once it's opened, it needs to go in the refrigerator or the freezer to store because once it's opened, it's exposed to the moisture and the yeast um, just doesn't have as long a shelf life that way. So once it's open, store it in the refrigerator and the freezer between uses. You don't have to bring it out and let it come to room temperature. I, I pour mine up into a one quart canning jar, glass canning jar, and I just keep it on the door of my freezer, take it out, put my whatever, however much I need to in my bread dough, stick the jar right back in my freezer. So um, that's the way to store it. You don't need uh, quite as much instant yeast as you do uh, of your normal, like active dry yeast. So if you have an older recipe that calls for active dry yeast, you can use a little bit less of the, of the instant yeast. In, a, in those little small packages that you find in the store, there's about two and a half teaspoons of yeast there to substitute for those packages of yeast, you only need about two teaspoons of the instant yeast. 
bread machine yeast, don't need it. This, this will work just fine. You don't have to buy specialty yeast to use in your bread machine. Rapid rise yeast really is a little extra yeast in that package. So if you need to rise something really quickly because you didn't start your bread dough in t uh, soon enough, then just use a little extra yeast and that'll make that bread dough rise a little faster and put it in a warm place. But we'll talk more about that in another segment. So um, that's your yeast. Now, in yeasted breads, in our recipe collection and in my uh, book, The Essential Homeground Flour Book, you're going to see optional ingredients, lecithin and gluten. Now, gluten I only put in there as an optional ingredient years ago when the wheat quality was just not very good. There had been flooding that year and the moisture content was really high in the wheat, so it, was, it just didn't have enough protein to give me that stretchy structure that I needed. So I added a little bit of gluten there. But today I just don't need to add the gluten, so I don't mention it very, you know, very much. And uh, I don't use it personally. I don't think I need it. So, um, so, but if you want to add a little extra gluten, you certainly can, but we don't recommend it because that upsets the, the flour to fiber, the gluten ratio. So unless you are really got a poor quality wheat, and then we have other tricks we'll teach you in another segment. Um, but anyway, lecithin, we love. This is a sunflower seed lecithin. Lecithin is an emulsifier. It's a nutrient that your body has to have. It loves, you get it in grains and beans, any unrefined food without, uh, that hasn't, any unrefined food with oil that hasn't had that, those fats and oils processed out. Lecithin is, an, like I said, is an emulsifier. It helps you digest fat. But we're not adding it to our bread for the nutritional benefits necessarily. Grains already have lots of lecithin. But why we are adding it is, like I said, it's an emulsifier. So it breaks down the fats and oils in the recipe, in the dough, helps them go into the dough a little easier and mix with that water a little easier. And so it makes a much softer bread, a smoother texture. You know, lecithin is used in the food industry, which I'm not a big fan of foods that they use lecithin in, but just to give you an idea, it's used in margarine to make margarine more spreadable. It's used in salad dressings to keep that oil and vinegar mixed. It's used in Reese's peanut butter cups, but don't eat Reese's peanut butter cups to get your lecithin. Eat your grains and beans to get your lecithin. But that's why we put it in the bread dough. You will really notice a difference in the smoothness of, and the texture of the bread and the fineness of the crumb of the bread. We get lots of comments, um, many questions of, my family, you know, I can't make a sandwich with this bread, it, it crumbles. Lecithin will help with that. It really helps with the smoothness and the texture of the bread. And I can notice a difference when I use it and when I don't use it. I use about two tablespoons for our basic bread dough, which is about four and a half cups of flour. So that'll give you some idea if you have a favorite bread recipe. Um, you, you can use about that ratio, two tablespoons to four to five cups of flour. Now, lecithin, much of the lecithin out there comes from soy, which we don't advocate the use of soy too much. And um, so we found uh, this last year, we found this sunflower seed lecithin, and we're just very, very, very happy with it. And um, we think you'll notice a difference when you add lecithin to your bread. And then here at Bread Beckers, and after many years of research, I discovered that much like uh, what's done to our grains by sifting the bran and germ out and stripping all the great nutrients away and leaving us with white flour and so much of the food processing industry that has just taken away everything that's good and tries to put some things, chemical things, back in to fortify, but that you can never improve on God. The same is true in the salt industry. And I'm like, why would they mess with salt if it's a preservative? It doesn't spoil. So what's going on? Refined salt, like you find in the store, has had the minerals stripped out of them to sell to other industries. And then 
heat treated to very high temperatures, 1,200 degrees or more, to make the salt crystals very hard so they do not readily absorb moisture. When I was growing up, there was a little uh, salt company that had this slogan, when it rains, it pours. And that's kind of the premise of why salt is heat treated like that. So we found a company called Redmond uh, Salt, and their salt is called Real Salt. It is only mined from the ground. And you'll see uh, it has speckles and it's a little pink and that's the, the source of the salt. Gives it those, that's the tra those colors and that's the trace minerals that are there. And uh, we just advocate only using unrefined salt because refined salt causes uh, your body to need water to try to absorb that salt. And so that's, that's some of the... Um, connection between salt and water retention. So real salt, and uh, we use that in all of our recipes, and we just replace it one for one for salt called for in a recipe. So those are our basic dry ingredients that we need for bread making. So now let's look at our sweeteners and our oil. So for me, I am always an advocate of honey. I use honey where honey will work. Honey, to me, is the only truly unrefined, all natural, no process necessary, except that which is done by the bees. So all to gather honey, basically you just take it from the beehive. So again, though, you want unpasteurized raw honey. And uh, the honey we get here at Bread Beckers is all unpasteurized. So honey is my sweetener of choice, and it's so easy to use, particularly in yeasted breads. Most recipes for yeast bread that do call for some sweetener, it's usually a much, a, a very small amount compared to the flour in the recipe. So for that reason, I decided early on to just substitute honey one for one in my yeast bread. So if it called for a quarter cup of sugar, I would use a quarter cup of honey. Or like in my basic bread dough recipe, it calls for a third a cup of honey. The recipe that I kind of adapted was a third a cup of sugar. So I just use the same amount of honey. Because remember, in yeasted breads, you can always adjust the flour. But I found that with that small amount of sweetener in yeast bread recipes, I needed that sweetness, that same amount of sweetness. And so, yes, it made the, a little more liquid there, but I could compensate with using a little extra flour. So that's honey. Now, there's uh, recommendations about not feeding honey to children under two. And um, that, that's your decision as far as putting the honey like raw on bread or toast or whatever. But I just want to point out that once the bread is baked, that is no longer an issue. So if you are baking bread and you're using honey, don't be afraid at all to give it to your toddler that may be less than two to eat because once it's baked. But then you need to make the decision of whether you want to put a little honey on their bread for them to enjoy. But um, general rule of thumb with honey, I, I'm not sure if you can tell as much uh, from uh, on the video here on the film, but the darker the honey, the stronger the flavor, the lighter the honey, the milder the flavor. So, uh, you know, if that makes a difference in your bread making, you may want to choose a milder honey in some things. But uh, actually, I use our uh, honey that we have called the bakery grade honey. That's what I use in most all of my baking. We are in a somewhat of a honey crisis in this country, actually kind of worldwide. And some years ago, you probably noticed as well, honey prices shot way up. So here at Bread Beckers, we reached out to our supplier that's from Omega, Georgia, and asked them if they could find us a less expensive honey that would be perfect for baking. And they did, and it's called the bakery, bakery grade honey. And it doesn't mean it's a lesser grade of honey. There's not grades of honey like there are in meats and eggs or milk or whatever. But um, all it is, is it's just uh, honey from a type of flour that's not very well known and not very popular. So it's not like a wildflower, clover, orange blossom. Those are what are termed table honeys. 
because people ask for them by variety. The bakery honey comes from the Brazilian pepper plant, and that's not from Brazil. It doesn't come from Brazil, but it's a flowering plant that grows uh, kind of Vero Beach, Florida, and south. Very prolific. I don't know if you're from around Georgia listening to this, but it's like our kudzu that once you plant it, it just takes off. I actually had the pleasure of, of seeing uh, the Brazilian pepper plant in bloom when I was visiting Florida a few years ago. And uh, it's quite prolific, has a very long blooming season, which gives the bees a chance to gather the nectar and make the honey. So it's, it's more prolific honey. They get a lot more volume from it, so it's able to be a little less expensive. So it is a, a little bit stronger than, say, a clover or an orange blossom or a sage or tupelo, but it, it works very well in all of my baking. And if you make as much bread as I do, you need uh, a, something a little more economical. So that's honey. Uh, we sell it by the gallon, which I recommend if you're going to start baking all of your own bread, from freshly milled flour and stop using white sugar and substitute honey in your breads, go ahead and get you a gallon because you'll be shocked at how fast you go through it. So that's our honey. Um, honey, a lot of people ask, sometimes uh, some varieties of honey are mo more prone to crystallization. And uh, if that happens, it doesn't hurt the quality of the honey you just do melt it down. And on that note, I want to point out that much of the commercial honey that you'll buy in the grocery store has been pasteurized. And the pasteurization destroys enzymes just like it does in other foods and some of the, um, the nutrients in the honey that are naturally occurring. But the reason they do that is so it destroys the, the potential of that crystallization. So it doesn't readily crystallize as much. But for our purposes, we really want to go with unpasteurized honey. And a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna bake with it, so what does it matter? Because of the pasteurization destroying some of the enzymes, um, you're not baking your bread, you're not getting up to pasteurization temperature. In fact, if you think about it logically, you may be baking your bread at 350, 400, even some sourdoughs at 500 degrees, but your internal temperature of your bread when it's done is only 180, uh, about 190 degrees. So unpasteurized raw honey to get the full benefits of the nutrients and all the goodness that God created there. Um, lots of nutrients in honey. Don't just let somebody tell you it's no different than sugar. Lots of minerals, lots of enzymes, even some amino acids, lots of just goodness for you. So that's honey. So it's easy, easy to substitute. We'll talk more uh, later when we talk about quick breads that typically use a lot more honey than flour. And in those instances, I'll just go ahead and mention typically the general rule of substitution from sugar to honey is cut the honey amount in half. So if you have a recipe that say calls for two cups of sugar, I would cut it down and substitute a cup of honey, maybe even a little less. Some of my quick bread recipes I use less than, less than half. So that is honey and uh, just my sweetener of choice. I use it where it works and in yeast breads and uh, even most of my quick breads, it works very, very well. Now for oil. There's plenty of, of good oils out there, but I have chosen and prefer to use extra virgin olive oil. And uh, it, it works, and if it's real olive oil, it does not lend a bitter or um, overpowering flavor to your breads. What do I mean by real olive oil? Unfortunately, Olive oil, again, is uh, an industry that lacks integrity, like, unfortunately, most of our food industry. So much of the olive oil, even what's labeled extra virgin olive oil, on your shelves in the grocery store have been mixed with other oils. And that's, it's been out in the news, and you can read it and find it for yourselves. It's, the literature is out there that it's just, not what you think it is. In fact, we had an olive oil tested that we were selling years ago, an extra virgin olive oil, 
was labeled extra virgin olive oil and it had less than 1% olive oil in it. So we uh, found a supplier that is Greek and our olive oil comes from small farms in the Isle of Crete and comes directly packaged from Greece. And we know that this is truly extra virgin olive oil. I substitute it one for one in my recipes. Any recipe that calls for oil, I'm gonna use extra virgin olive oil. I love the flavor and it's so good for you. And uh, the thing about olive oil and what, how it is, uh, can be labeled extra virgin, it's, it's based on an acidity. It has to be 0.8% or less. And our olive oil, we have several varieties in uh, coming from different farms in Greece, and they are 0.5 or less, which makes it an even better quality extra virgin olive oil. We think you'll love our, ex our olive oils, any of the ones that you can purchase. So that is our basic list of getting started items for freshly milled flour, baking with freshly milled flour for yeasted breads, breads that use yeast. And let me just put this little note in here, a lot of interest this past year, especially on sourdough bread. So sourdough is still um, a yeast leavened bread. Yes, it's natural yeast and um, with uh, lactobacillus bacteria mix that makes that bread rise, but you still need that high protein that development of that stretchy substance called gluten to capture that carbon dioxide and enable the bread to rise. So whether you're using commercial yeast or sourdough, if you are using a leavening, a natural leavening or yeasted leavening, you still need your hard wheat varieties. Hard red, hard white are my choices.